Good morning, everybody, and welcome. My name is Casey Carroll. I'm an instructional designer with the Center for Teaching Excellence. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Integrating Reflection in Study Abroad. So today's webinar's facilitators are Morgan Collins, Nicole Fisk, and Taylor Armstrong. So please join me in welcoming our facilitators by typing welcome or hello in the chat box. And I will go ahead and turn it over to y'all as I switch to the PowerPoint. Um. My name is Taylor Armstrong, um, and I'm joined today by my two colleagues, Morgan and Nicole. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about how we can integrate reflection into study abroad programming. Um, students can naturally find meaning in their experiences abroad, but we encourage and have found that reflection really can guide their thinking to help process their time abroad in ways that can actually develop them more into global leaders um, and just generally better citizens. Um, so today we'll be covering the a little bit of the experiential learning process and how it's integrated into programming we offer. We'll talk about why reflection is important and how to implement it into programming. And we'll provide some feasible examples that you can take with you after this um, session. And if at time, um, we have time at the end, we will do our own reflection of our webinar today. Starting with introductions, I will introduce myself a little bit more to give you more context. Um, I am the figure on the left, Taylor. I work in the Education Abroad Office and have been here for over four and a half years. I currently serve as an advisor in the office where I advise students that you likely work with here at USC Columbia um, on education abroad opportunities. Um, I am also a USC Columbia alum who studied abroad while I was in the Darlamore School of Business. So I like to think I know a little bit of both sides of the process, the student perspective, and of course now the administrative perspective. Um, I studied abroad while I was at USC in London, but the programs I chose to highlight today are ones in which I've served as a professional um, facilitator for, um, specifically two programs um, for faculty and staff, which I'll highlight a little bit, um, in South Africa and Sweden. And I have uh, coordinated two student uh, programs to Canada and Costa Rica. But Morgan, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, thanks Taylor. Um, my name is Morgan Collins. I'm an instructor and academic advisor in the School of Public Health. Um, I am also an alum of USC Columbia and studied abroad as a student. Fell in love with travel and um, got an opportunity to take students abroad with uh, my co-instructor in several trips, two to Ireland and one to Greece and Italy. So I'll be sharing some of my experiences a little bit later on. Okay, um, hello everyone. My name is Nicole Fisk and I'm Associate Director of the First Year English Program. I work particularly with the Capstone Scholars Learning Community at U of SC Columbia and I took my first group of Capstone scholar students, um, several of whom had taken my English 101 and 102 classes to Ireland in 2017 for an English 282 fiction course. I was scheduled to take my second group of students to Portugal, London in May 2020, but then COVID happened. The trip was postponed to this May, but COVID is still happening, unfortunately. I'm hoping the third try uh, will be the charm, although we've decided to shelve it for a bit just because it's so sad for the students who have applied two years in a row to have aged out by a year. That said, all the materials have been developed, so I'll refer to some of those in my part of the presentation, as well as materials I put together for Ireland. Let me tell y'all quickly about my introductory photo that we're all looking at, because I want to give kudos to Study Abroad's expertly curated team of program providers. When we were in Ireland, our CIEE in-country program representative, Mariah, noticed that my students got excited whenever we saw sheep 
which was often. So on the bus trip back from the West Coast to Dublin, she arranged a surprise stop at an Irish sheep farm, and we got to watch an Irish sheepdog training. So that's me with one of the stars um, of a working Irish sheep farm. I'm so glad that you shared that, Nicole. That's an amazing story. <laughs> yeah, that's a perfect photo. Awesome. Okay, so getting uh, getting started, I did want to give a little bit of a foundation as to what education abroad is as a high impact practice. So it very much is a high impact practice, um, educational practice, and what we find uh, that makes education abroad so unique is that it intertwines structured in-class learning with a simultaneous experience uh, component. So some experiences are kind of uh, an additional option. So like uh, internships or um, some uh, service opportunities, but education abroad tends to kind of combine. Um, and a lot of learning can actually stem from the interactions that happen in the classroom, whether that's through cultural changes or norms. Um, so there's a lot of layers here. Students are doing a structured learning opportunity at the same time that they're experiencing something completely new. Um, through uh, education abroad, students will gain um, knowledge of human cultures and in the physical and natural world. That's pretty obvious. They're usually going somewhere new and experiencing a different interaction with a culture or many cultures. Uh, they also develop intellectual and practical skills. So that includes like communication skills. Um, even if there's not always a foreign language that's being facilitated on site because it might be a group of US or USC students together, there's still a lot of different dynamics in that group that can um, lead to communication development skills. Critical thinking, problem solving, independence, all of that can stem from these opportunities. Um, integrative and applied learning as well. So that would be pretty obvious as to the whole process here is they're taking what they learn in the class and how they can apply it to their everyday lives. Um, personal and social responsibility, sorry, skipped that one. Um, so they're learning about intercultural, um, they're developing knowledge of different cultures um, and developing more competence and tolerance of other um, opinions and ways of life. Um, and all these experiences can challenge preconceived um, ideas, notions, uh, biases towards specific cultures or locations, topics, or even really themselves. It does set them up to to be challenging and uh, kind of reflecting back into to themselves and challenging who they were before the program and even after the program. So um, there are opportunities as faculty and staff as part of um, really any, any higher learning institution here in the state to participate um, and develop an education abroad program for a term. I can really only speak to the process here at USC Columbia, but if you are from a different institution or a different branch, you're welcome to reach out to me and I can um, look into the networks that are that we have with the other institutions and get you in contact with them. Um, Faculty-led programming is really the term that we that we use in the field. So faculty-led or faculty-facilitated programming opens up a, an avenue for you as mentors and leaders and faculty and support to develop programming for students and incorporate this experiential learning opportunity for them. Um, programming must meet a variety of standards, which include obviously the academic component. So we wanna make sure it's meeting the competencies and requirements outlined by your academic department. Additionally, there are health and safety and risk measures that have to be met. Um, that's usually reviewed and vetted by our office. And then obviously the focus of this presentation today is the experiential learning criteria. So this entire process requires planning 
and alignment of course outcomes with the actual on-site programming. But it's important to remember and to think actively that this begins the moment you decide to develop a course. Uh, the experiential learning component is not something that can just be implemented on the fly where you have a couple of free moments where, okay, let's just take a break and reflect and there's no guidance or anything. This really has to be implemented and ingrained into the program the moment you decide to develop the course. The syllabus serves as a wonderful roadmap of course outcomes and how they can intertwine and connect with reflection. Um, and so it's really important that as you develop the course, you're constantly thinking not only about the academic side, but how it can connect to this integrative learning technique. Additionally, experiential learning starts way before the program actually begins. So a lot of students especially think that the program um, starts and ends while you're on site, so while you're abroad. And that's very much not the case. A lot of um, programming has uh, pre-departure orientation or meetings, which really kind of set the foundation for the program. It's a good chance to get to know everyone and you know match names to faces, but uh, more importantly, it's a really, really viable time to manage the expectations of the program, outlining that reflection and this component of experiential and integrative learning is part of the program. And then it's also uh, a good time to develop and set the foundation for how it's going to be conducted. Uh, I know for pre-departure for one of my programs, I led to Costa Rica, which I think Nicole also said she did something very similar. Um, is we used pre-departure as a time for students to take a part of the culture or a part of the program. Um, so for my program, it was a global health program to Costa Rica. So I separated different facets of the culture out and paired students up to present about um, public health in Costa Rica or food in Costa Rica. Um, and it really kind of opened the eyes a little bit more to students as to what their program might look like on site. It's not always beautiful tropical um, sunshine, for instance. It rains like pretty much every day that you're there in Maine. So that also kind of set the expectation that you're not going to be spending every day out in the sun and enjoying the, the lovely benefits of that. But additionally, it also kind of just set a good kind of boundary of what the program will look like and how students can build off of that. Okay, so a little bit more of a breakdown of the experiential learning criteria that's required for programming, at least here at USC. So there has to be significant time and effort in the engagement. So it has to have a minimum of 45 hours of engagement. There have to be clear expectations. So a lot of that is used in the form of a syllabus or a guide or a handbook or an itinerary. Uh, obviously required reflection is probably the most integral part of this whole process and what we will focus on the most up here today in this, this webinar. So reflection can look like assignments or projects, some more formalized things, or it can be a little bit more informal like journals or blogs or just meetings like group meetings or paired discussions that students have. So it really can vary. And then of course feedback. So it is our duty as educators to provide feedback to students. And I think that really does continue the cycle of reflection. It's not just this unilateral, like one time um, process, right? Like many of you who have engaged in some sort of really any <laughs> experiential activity often can reflect back on it. I, I studied abroad um, 10 years ago and I'm still thinking of things that came up while I was um, abroad and reflect on it. So I think the feedback component really does continue the cycle and encourage students to continue to participate and engage. Okay, so if I've totally blown your mind about how awesome education abroad is and study abroad is for, um, for students and you are feeling like, wow, I really wish I had an opportunity to engage in some sort of structured um, program like this or maybe develop um, some perspective of what it would be like on the student side of the program. Um, I have a lovely treat for you. Um, we have 
a, a program called the International Perspectives of Higher Education, or IPHE for short, that is facilitated by our office here at USC Columbia. It's an opportunity for faculty and staff to engage in a study abroad program. You would be a participant. You would not be a leader. You would be led by another faculty member and often a study abroad office um, uh, staff person like me. Um, so this is the program I did to Sweden and South Africa where we led a group of faculty and staff and they are participants. So we are guiding y'all through the experiential learning process with active reflection. Um, so you're kind of able to develop the student perspective a bit more, which can then be a really helpful tool when you come back and develop some sort of program um, for your students. Mostly the program is used, uh, we use blog posts and facilitated group discussions. So this past, well, no, it was a whole year ago. Um, when we went to Sweden, we did a blog post where each individual took a different part of the program and actively um, wrote a reflection piece about that. So I'm happy to discuss a bit more of that with y'all at the end if you have any questions about it. Morgan is also a multi, uh, multi participant of the program, so she would be another really great um, tool to use as well. Okay, so switching gears here a little bit to why reflection is important. So in the context of study abroad, we know that students naturally find connections and meanings to their experiences. But the guided reflection is an important part of the learning process. The reflection helps students make connections to their experiences. So we typically use this as a progression of connections. So when students first arrive, sometimes there's a, there's a lot of heightened emotions. They're either really excited or maybe a little bit associated or just kind of thinking that things are the same. Um, reflection can really kind of set students in the experience a bit more. So connect them with where they are. It's almost some sort of like a, a grounding exercise of here's where we are. You can start with small, simple connections. So what's new? What do you see? Sensory kind of situations of uh, what do you see? What do you smell? What's different? And then you can kind of progress that into, okay, what was your reaction to some of that? Um, and can challenge a little bit more of their, their thinking and their response. Reflection also helps students process and understand the importance of their experience. So sometimes we have students who are very much this kind of there because it's a fun travel, time, they've never been to Costa Rica before, and it's so tropical and fun, which is very much true, and that is fine, and we want to acknowledge those those emotions and those, um, those connections. But we also have a purpose, a greater purpose, right? So it's a good way to, reflection is a good way to kind of set students back um, on the right track. Um, it's also a good way to process um, what's happening. So there's a lot of times programming is go, 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 go. And there's not really a lot of time for students to kind of like set back, digest, and think about what's going on and reflect on it. So that's probably one of my favorite um, points to make is that reflection really does kind of just set the, the speedometer back to zero. Let's talk about what's going on and then let's pick up from where we are from there. It's also a good way to kind of get the pulse on what students are feeling like on site. And it's also a really good way to keep you engaged as a faculty member with the students. Um, you also, uh, reflection helps students articulate and use what they've learned in their experiences to their everyday lives. So this is the greater purpose, right? It's not always about what you did then, but how you can actually apply what you've learned and outcomes and insights that you've taken from this experience and connecting it to coursework that they've had and um, maybe other experiences they've had and bring it to a greater skill. Okay, now I'm gonna pass it over to Morgan. 
Thanks, Taylor. Um, so just wanted to address a couple of things that have come in the chat so far. So Casey shared that he had journals given to him and his fellow classmates when they went on study abroad trips. We're going to talk about journals um, here in just a little bit, so we'll definitely talk about that. But it's a great way. Journals are really easy, so um, that's a good thing. And if we're trying to to decrease the barriers to reflection, giving journals to students in their hands is a good way to do that. Um, and then Megan shared that she took a course on reverse culture shock when she got back from a study abroad semester and had some assignments that are really meaningful to her. So that's um, a cool way to also think about, even if you don't take students abroad and you interact with students when they do come back from a study abroad experience, you can still ask them questions and get them thinking um, reflectively even if it's just a conversation, if you're an academic advisor, that happens to me a lot as an academic advisor. Um, I'll see students when they come home and I'll have to ask that those reflective questions just to help them think through what happened and what their experience was like and why that was important. So it can be long lasting, definitely. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the logistics for developing your reflection activities and integrating them into your course plan. Um, I will just make a note that this is just from my experience of things that have worked for me and my co-instructor. Um, if you guys have other ideas and want to share those, that's welcome. Um, but this is just some things that we talked about post study abroad experiences with students, um, that things that worked and things that we may tweak from semester to semester or summer to summer. So um, the first thing that we like to do is set some ground rules. And this can be done either by you, the instructor and co-instructor, or by students. So sometimes we'll ask students to um, set a list of expectations for behavior. Um, and that can be providing a safe space for conversations to happen. Um, so that's something that we'd like to talk about before we even leave, is that everybody has a voice and everybody's opinion is important even if it's different from something that you think or something that you've experienced, it's still worthwhile and it's still important to listen um, and interact with students who may have a different opinion. So creating those safe spaces, that could be group conversations. It also could be sort of one-on-one -on -one between the student and the instructor for things like journal assignments and, and other, others like that. Um, we also like to set requirements for reflection. So we talk about what reflection means and how to go through the steps of reflection and what should be included in a reflection assignment, whether that be a journal or something else. Um, we talk about how you should describe your experience, talk about why that experience was important to you, why it stands out to you, and then what you're going to do differently because you had that experience. We're interpreting what you um, experienced and how it's going to change you going forward. So we try to give students a little bit of structure um, so that they know they've checked the boxes um, somewhat to help them with that process. It gets easier over time for students. Um, many of them, in my experience, don't really know how to do that right off the bat. So we go through a couple of examples and talk through them, um, give them a lot of feedback early on, and then talk through um, some more challenging questions later on in the program or give them a little more flexibility and freedom to write or do other activities on their own um, with less structure later on, as they have some more experience with that. Uh, we also like to make our expectations clear, especially if you're going to require reflection, you're going to use it as part of your course grade. Um, so rubrics are awesome for that. Um, even if you are going to have them do a physical project and it's not going to be done through Blackboard or virtually, you can use a rubric just so that they know what you're going to, how you're going to be grading them. It's also good for you as an instructor to make sure that you're grading fairly across all students. Um, we took somewhere from 20 to 30 students abroad at every trip that I've been on, and it can be tedious to read journals. So just to make sure you're consistent, the rubrics can be really great. Um, we'd like to walk a fine line between structure and flexibility. So not every student is a wonderful writer. Not every student processes information by writing. So a journal activity is great for some, might not be the best avenue for reflection for others. They may um, talk through their experiences. So thinking about providing opportunities for a variety of reflection activities is kind of important. Um, even if you don't require all of them, you may have 
journals that are part of your course grade, but you may do small group reflections to help them think through and talk through some of their experiences before they submit their written journals to help them just sort of start that process. So thinking about options and providing some flexibility. We'll talk a little bit more later on about some just logistical things that can happen, but you know, sometimes you may run into a situation where a student doesn't have access to Wi-Fi, and if your reflection journals are done on Blackboard, then that can cause some problems. So being able to be flexible and um, change the plan if necessary is important. Um, we always start with open-ended questions. So it may, uh, you may ask students to refer back to a particular experience that they've had, or you can start with just general questions about um, what have you seen, like Taylor mentioned, why is this important? Why are we having you do these activities? Um, and so starting out with open-ended questions so that the student has an opportunity to think and develop their own response um, that is not necessarily right or wrong um, is important. And along with that, being able to sit in some quiet spaces and allow students time to think and process information is really important. So when you ask an open-ended question, they may not have um, immediate responses. They may take some time to think about that. They may come back to you even the following day and talk to you about what they thought about and what things have come to their mind. Um, certainly if you're going to use reflection activities as part of your grade in the course, you want to think about connecting those back to your course outcomes. Um, so what do you want students to be able to do by the end of your experience? And then you can use reflection as a way to target those um, specific outcomes and provide you a way to measure those outcomes as well. So um, reflection activities can do both. And then we always provide resources. So things that you can print out and pass out to students. Um, journals, if you're going to provide actual physical journals for students to write in. Um, you may have electronic versions of things like rubrics or guidelines or things like that. Um, in our classes, we had a group me, and so I would post not only to Blackboard, but also to the group me, a screenshot of the reflection questions and the rubric, just so students had them in multiple places. So providing some resources um, is a really important step, so students, again, are aware of the expectations and have something they can look back on to help them with that structure. So a couple of questions that we like to ask students in reflection activities. Um, we're going to talk about these. And when you're thinking about what questions to ask, we like to recommend that you think about what students are going through at various points in your experience, your study abroad trip. Um, they may have, like Taylor mentioned, early on in their experience, they may be overwhelmed with just things are different, their culture is different, the food is different, they're not sleeping in their bed, they're living out of their suitcase, and so there may be some anxiety or stress that they're dealing with. Everything is brand new, so they may be trying to take in lots of things and they can't take in everything. So you might want to do an easier question or a more obvious question towards the beginning. You can ask something um, more specific to content, maybe in the middle, and then a sort of wrapping up question or a more complicated question after the experience is winding down or is over. So think about what your students might be going through at each point in the trip, and you can tailor your questions to those experiences. So a question that I really like for my students kind of early on, um, and also for students who are returning that I'm advising or interacting with post experience, um, is how was it different than what you expected it to be? And why did you think that difference occurred? And how has your perspective changed because you had that experience? So like Taylor mentioned, when students go to Costa Rica, they think that it's going to be this lush tropical experience. They're going to be sitting out in the sun all day long, but that was not necessarily the case. Um, so we talk through what that experience was like and how that might have been different from their expectations. And then they may learn from their, um, you know, that they don't need to have some sort of bias towards this particular uh, region or culture or something like that. So they can talk through how their perspective has changed because they've had a study abroad experience. Um, the second question there is, what about your experience sparked your curiosity? So thinking about 
gaps in information. Maybe they heard something from one of your speakers or from an experience that you had, um, a cultural experience that you had when your study abroad, and maybe that sparked their curiosity. They want to know more about that, or they realized that they didn't know everything that they thought they knew about that topic, and so they can write down questions that they thought about as they were listening to a presenter or um, going through an experience. So what sparked your curiosity? And then this is sort of a follow-up or wrapping up question. What advice would you give other students who are about to embark on something similar to something that you've done? Um, so would you, another way to phrase that is would you do things differently if you were going through this experience again? Um, so how would you change your experience? What would you do differently? Um, what would you suggest to other students to do? A lot of times I hear students say I would get more involved or I wouldn't be so nervous to try something. Um, so that's a question that usually poses some really interesting answers. So this is really hard to see, but this is another resource that we'll be sending to you in the follow-up email. Um, it's one of the resources that I provide for my students before we go. We talk through what this looks like and how it can be used to write reflectively specifically. So we talk about the reflective writing uh, reflection wheel. So we talk about that process and how you should describe, talk about how you felt during that experience, analyze it, and um, then you can also turn it into an action. So what are you going to do post-experience? Um, but the two screenshots at the bottom with the charts will go together. But this is one that I really use a lot is um, give students a lot of structure. So this is really helpful as they're starting to think about reflective writing. Walks them through how to put together their sentences. So the, it'll give you the first part of the sentence and you fill in the details about your experience and sort of answer the questions. Um, so they can choose to talk about, for me, the most meaningful learning happened when blank, fill in the blank. Um, so it's walk students through that process. Um, if you're not going to use writing as an opportunity for reflection, it still can be helpful to help them think about how to talk about it. So you can ask them, for you, the most meaningful learning happened when, and they can answer that. So um, this is a good way to sort of structure it and get you, get you keen as an instructor of what kind of questions you'll ask, but also helps the students to think about how they're going to write or what they should write about if you're going to use a journal activity, for example. So different options for adding reflection activities into your plan. Um, there are unlimited ideas, but these are some things that we've seen done or have used ourselves. Um, reflection journals is probably the most popular. Um, so you can have them do electronic journals or um, physical journals that they can take and write in. Either way is OK. Small group discussions, um, sometimes that can be hard, like Taylor said, having to structure that time in. So you want to definitely think about that ahead of time. If you want to have a small group discussion, plan that in your day. Make sure students know that's going to be happening later on so they have some time to think and process and be ready for that discussion group. Um, show and tell, this happened unexpectedly in one of our study abroad groups. We had our students writing journals and a student collected items to add to her journal. Um, and so she would bring those items to our discussion group or leave them in her journal for us to read about. And she would describe why that item was important and what the experience around that item represented to her. So bringing in an item that they can use as a starting point is something helpful. Um, visual or performing arts, they can draw pictures, they can sing songs, you know, all those kinds of things. Creative writing, uh, writing stories or poetry. Blogs, like Taylor mentioned, um, is popular as well. If you wanted to share that with family members back home, that's a cool way to get other people involved, um, writing a blog or keeping a social media, creating portfolios or e-portfolios, um, presentations. This is most of the time uh, either before or after, so helping students think about what to expect when they arrive in country, what kinds of things they will be seeing and sort of doing some pre-research on those topics so that they're prepared for their experiences or when they return from their study abroad experience and they can go through um, talking about why that was important or what they learned from it. Um, photo contests, we've done that a couple of times, having students um, take pictures. They're going to take pictures with their phones and then they'll send 
their pictures into the group me and then they'll get to vote on what photos were the most important um, and you can set prompts for that so send us a picture of something that shows the most learning or shows the coolest whatever you want to do um, so you can set some really specific prompts for photo contest if you're looking for something specific um, and then elevator pitches that is also typically towards the end talking about making your experience into a concise you know one or two minute brief answer to how was it because they're going to get that question when they get home and you want them to say more than it was amazing you know you'd love for them to be able to say i learned so much about x y and z um, so you want them to start thinking about how they're going to answer that question of how was your study abroad trip an elevator pitch is a good way to do that all right i'm going to turn it over to nicole Thank you, Morgan. So I thought it might be useful to share some specific examples here, a sort of tips and tricks list for reflection activities. So the first tip is to consider weaving together course material with experiential learning. So my English 282 course in Portugal and London that got canceled because of COVID, but will hopefully be able to run eventually, is entitled Fantastic Fiction and Where to Find It. Portugal and London as inspiration for J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter series. So a little bit of background, I've taught English 101 and 102 theme classes on Harry Potter, and this English 282 course uses the series to teach the elements of fiction. As one of the elements of fiction is setting, is a fun course to teach for study abroad. For those of you who are distracted because wondering what does Portugal have to do with the British series, J.K. Rowling was teaching abroad in Portugal while writing the first book and planning out the series. So here are a couple of prompts I wrote for students reflection journals that tie together course readings with attractions they'll be visiting. Um, you'll notice the prompts are very focused and very guided, but I feel like that's often useful when there's so much stimulation. In a way, it's the tour guide through the course material version of tour guides through the country. So uh, the first journal prompt reads, as you visit the Chiado today, and that's like a um, Portuguese market area, compare your experience to Harry's in chapter five of Sorcerer's Stone when he explores Diagon Alley for the first time. How does Diagon Alley as a traditional shopping area provide a useful setting for either establishing Harry's character or carrying forward the plot or both? So the second journal um, prompt has to do with an activist museum in Lisbon. After you visit the activist museum, consider what you have learned about Antonio Salazar and how might J.K. Rowling's fictional characters, for example, Salazar Slytherin and his descendants, reflect the historical figure? What have you learned about life under a dictatorial regime, and how do these realities translate into Rowling's fictional novels driving conflict and plot? Okay, next slide. Um, my second tip, is to think of ways to make individual reflections more collaborative. Because I rely so heavily on using reflection journals for a course like this, I have to consciously build in opportunities for collaboration. Unlike blog posts, which are often available and consumed by the public, journals suggest private reflection. So my students write in their journals and they share it with me, but I also want them to share in some form with their classmates. So I was able to do that for my Irish fiction students through one of their portfolio assignments. Specifically, I asked them to compose one creative piece that engages with course content, for example, your own picture book or fairy tale about Ireland. In the end, they all took the fairy tale or short story option, and so we put their writing together in a self-published collection of short stories that they were then able to purchase at as a keepsake at cost of production. So this final project ended up being a very large group discussion in a way that they could keep in print. 
this is reflecting full circle. In this little slide, we're going to talk about end of process things to remember. The first of which is to ask follow up questions. These are sample responses to student reflections and shout out to Morgan um, for these, which I wish I had earlier. Um, I'm just going to read you a couple that uh, a few that she shared with me. And um, as an example, in response to Noah picking Glenn King Farm for his story setting, I could have asked him, why does Glenn King Farm stand, stand out to you? What was important about that experience? How will you be different because of that experience? This sort of feedback is in keeping with what Barbara Fines of University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Law suggests is most useful. Um, I'm linking to a little smu.edu web page. I'll link in the comment thread. So I'm linking to a little smu.edu web page about assessing reflection, which includes a rubric and even Dr. Fine sample feedback, which at its simplest level might read, thank you for your reflection with some acknowledgement of the content such as you were not alone in concluding that blank or I agree that blank. Fines writes, if questions or reflection appear shallow or insincere, I primarily ask additional questions to prompt more thorough responses in future reflection. I think it's important to remember that some reflections aren't so much shallow or sincere as they are misunderstandings of the difference between reporting something and reflecting on it. The latter of which causes us to exercise an intellectual muscle we may, we may not be used to using. So um, finally, consider the lasting impact of reflection. Um, the, just to uh, let you guys know because I like to let you know why I chose the pictures that I did. So the photo on this slide is one of the more memorable activities we experienced in Ireland. We're all circled around Tom and his cottage that dates back to the 1870s and we're listening to him talk about growing up in Ireland and the history of County Mayo. So a photo is certainly one way to freeze a moment in time. Um, but if we look at our next slide, let's see. Reflection journals are definitely um, another. So let's look at them one last time for our final tip, which is focused on logistics. Think about how much or how little time you want your students to spend in front of a laptop while abroad, since this seems in some ways to defeat the purpose of a course focused on exper experiential learning. Consider having students purchase or gifting them, if program expense allows, inexpensive mini composition books. Save the bigger projects for the final exam period after students return stateside. There are lots of benefits to these little inexpensive reflection journals. A benefit of the re reflection journal is that it allows students to reflect wherever they can sit and still a moment. They're easily passable from student to instructor for grading. I would have a journal prompt on my syllabus, pass the journals to individual students, and then the next day they would just pass them back and I could literally throw them in my purse, right? And then I was able to read what they wrote and give them the journals back for the next prompt. And they become a keepsake. At the end of the trip, I would always have read their last journal response, and then they had that to keep forever. All right. And so I think we've done really well on time. It's 2.05, and we're in the Q&A session. So to explain these pictures, I have that little blurb. Um, Irish children's book author Oshin McGann illustrates while leading a Q&A session for U of SE students in Dublin. It's the most interesting 
question and answer session I've ever attended because the entire time we were asking him questions, he was working on a personalized illustration for us to take with us, which you'll see on the right to everyone at the University of South Carolina. So um, I don't know about Taylor and Morgan, but my art skills are definitely not sophisticated enough to be able to do something fancy like that for you all while you're asking us questions. But we'll at least try to answer your questions for you. So if you'd like to either raise your hand and turn your microphone on to ask, or if you want to type it in the chat box, we just want to give you an opportunity to do that. I actually have a question for you. Um, yes. You're, it's not specific to this, what we're talking about right here, but just as you were talking about the English courses that you teach and like the different very creative things you, you know, weave into it. I'm just wondering if you have any tips for like how you go about um, helping students to like interact and do group projects or just just to interact together, you know, overall. Because I mean, it's all it always feels kind of forced. Um, so you know, when I teach in traditional classroom settings, like you said, it's so much easier to break into small groups for discussion. Um, I find that much more challenging in study abroad because we're we're always going and we're always doing and, and often listening to other people. So I try to find those moments where I can have students sort of meet with each other and or I can meet with them in small groups when we're doing the logistical stuff of getting places. Like there are always opportunities that present themselves like when you are on the bus where you can get sort of small group discussions going about the reading or talking about reflecting on things that we've recently done together. You have to eat, right? Um, you know, the program leaders always made a habit of joining some, some different groups of students. And so, you know, the disadvantage is that, like I said, you don't have that classroom setting a lot of times where it's easy to break up. But the advantage is that you're t together basically, uh, you know, full days, evenings, right? So you're able to do a lot of live stuff together in, in um, small groups that facilitates these types of conversations. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you. So let me go to the next slide. Group exercise, reflecting on this presentation. So we thought it would be fun if we could have an opportunity to sort of practice what we preach, right? So um, in English 101 and English 102, we use this um, great little book called The Everyday Writer by Andrea Lunsford, who started the Writing Center at Stanford. It's just a lovely person. So she has some general questions in the everyday writer, uh, questions for reflection that you can use for just about anything, right? Whether a presentation like the one we just gave, writing of all genres. And so I thought that maybe we could break into randomized small groups and talk through maybe even just one of these four questions. Um, if you want to do all four questions, that's that's fine. But time wise, I mean, maybe everybody can just can just practice a little bit as far as reflecting. So here's a quote from Lunsford. When you reflect, you help ensure that what you have learned transfers, that you will be able to to use what what you've learned in other disciplines and situations. So um, it, you know, I was talking before about how you can report something, but then when you reflect, it, it exercises a completely different muscle. So here are the questions. What lessons have you learned from this presentation? From what you have learned, what can you apply to your future courses? What aspect of your course planning do you feel most confident about and why do you feel this way? How has thinking through integrative reflection and study abroad clarified your thinking, extended your knowledge, or deepened your understanding? So is there anything um, that you can really pinpoint as far as being able to, to take with you after today's session? 
Okay, so as we only have about 10 minutes left, I guess what I'll do is um, ask our audience if there's anyone who wants to volunteer they, some, something they talked about in um, their small group settings, either through raising their hand and volunteering it or typing it into chat. Hey, this is Joan. I'm from the College of Nursing, and I have led a couple of trips, mainly with our graduate students to the Netherlands and I'm working on um, hoping to get get everything more established with Germany and the Netherlands because of the pandemic, you know, things have been sort of crazy. And I do have a virtual study abroad course I have for this summer, which will be a combination, it's sort of a teaser to get students interested in both countries. So it'll be a quick teaser with them visiting different places in both Germany and the Netherlands. And, but what I, I liked and learned from here were some new, more creative ways to um, do reflections. So, and having a rubric is helpful as well. So thank you. Oh, thank you, Joan. And oh my goodness, I'm very envious of um, the Netherlands. That's some, some place I've always wanted to visit. And I love the idea of doing the virtual abroad teaser as far as getting right. students to sign up. I think that's awesome. All right, I think we have something for Megan here. One thing we discussed was helping students understand the difference between reporting and reflecting. One question we had was how to make journals effective without instructors reading them. That is an interesting question because I've never like not uh, read them. So I wonder if um, Taylor or Morgan had, um, have an experience or anybody in our audience even has an experience with it just being something they I, I guess encourage students to do without um without having an assessment uh, to that how, how would that work do you think uh for the costa rica program that i led it was it was a lot of public health students so the course was much more of a comparison of global and public health practices in Costa Rica, more than like a written, um, I think it's a lot easier for like Nicole's class, which is an English class to incorporate structured like writing and, and reading. Um, but for this course, we encouraged journals, um, but again, kind of uh, toting that line of flexibility for the students and mentioning the point that Morgan said, not every student is a super strong writer. So um, we felt that it was best to maybe give students a couple of options. So for some students, photography was much more up their alley. It was a way that they felt that they could engage and reflect. So we decided to um, offer that as an option um, or just really kind of encourage a couple of avenues. So a journal certainly was not required, but it ended up being that a few students like naturally selected that they were going to reflect and keep a journal. Purely, I think, from the perspective of like, you're going to want to refer back to this. And if that's through, you know, a daily journal or even photos or a mixture of both, or maybe you're a collector, I think as long as you prep them with that mindset of like, what do you want to refer back to that can help of course the journals are some of the best because it gives it a written tangible kind of thing instead of maybe losing a memory off of an association with a physical object but I think that the option oh i like this yeah morgan just uh typed into you that sounds great taylor as far as the um the optional aspect of it and then morgan says perhaps using their journals as a starting point conversation they would write and bring their answers to a conversation or having students write and trade with another student to read and or discuss. And I think when we think about journals too, we have to think about how much variety there is within the journals. Um, I can see maybe at the heart of Megan's question was, you know, that does seem to be a lot on the instructor to have, depending on how many people you're taking abroad with you, like to have 
30 journals to read sounds like so much, but because my prompts were so narrowed and focused and because they were handwriting, like it was only just a couple of pages in the mini composition notebook. So, so it wasn't necessarily, um, you know, reams of paper that I was reading either, right? So, I mean, that that's just um, also is, uh, also sort of testifies to the sort of options you have as far as that goes. So thanks, Taylor and Morgan, that's helpful. Yes, rubrics are, are great for that too. And I mean, honestly, like my grading, uh the the majority of my grading came for me with their final portfolios because i didn't want them in front of a laptop preparing assignments when they were in another country so the journals for me as far as assessing grading was more um participation points like if they they did it they got full credit and so um the essays that they did the creative writing assignment that they did those were things that that um, were turned in during the final exam period when they were back stateside. So the journals really were useful as like reflection that helped work towards those larger assignments rather than being things that I had to assess really carefully myself. I would like to also just note if we don't have any more questions that you're welcome to reach out to any of us I think if you have something you want to follow up with um, we're happy to answer more questions or talk you through anything you have that you're thinking about um, going forward. So we're here and available if you have anything to follow up with. All right, as we wrap up, um, again, if, if you still have any questions, please feel free to go ahead and put them in the chat if our presenters can hang around for another couple minutes. Um, but I just wanna say thank you uh, very much for uh, all of you for joining us today, but especially to Morgan, Nicole, and Taylor for your great presentation. Thanks everybody. This was fun. It was so nice seeing all of these faces that I've missed.